Hello board game brothers and sisters, I'm Adam Singer and welcome to another episode where I'll be letting you know of all the board games launching on Kickstarter and GameFound over the next week. And if you're new to the channel, we do this every week going over all the upcoming campaigns, so if you want to stay up to date, this is definitely the place to be. But before we get started, I do like to go over some new announcements and discoveries I just found out about over the past week. And I do have some really good updates. I know a lot of you are looking forward to some news on some of these games, especially this first one, which is that we finally got a release date for Slay the Spire. This was supposed to be released back in spring, but it kept game pushed back and now they have finally settled on a date and if you haven't played slay the spire this was originally a mobile game and it has expanded to console and steam as well but this is a really excellent game if you haven't had a chance to play it i do recommend downloading it i personally find it quite a challenge to find any mobile games i don't delete after the first five minutes and this is one that i actually got a lot of play time with basically a roguelike deck builder where you have a few different characters that all play very differently from each other and you're choosing between a few different paths to move up a giant spire and some of the different locations might have you fighting some weaker enemies or some stronger enemies or they might just have some different events where you get to make a choice or just have you heal or stop at a shop where you can purchase cards to upgrade your deck. The way that the cards combo and chain together is quite advanced in this game I don't think they'll be able to do exactly the same thing when it comes to an actual board game because it'd be a lot of overhead unless they also used an app to track it all but I don't think that's the plan here so I'm really interested to see what they come up with but if you want to follow along with that campaign you can go click that notify me button right now because they do have the preview page up and ready for you to check out and of course I'll also be covering this in a lot more detail the week that it launches so make sure that you subscribe here as well so you get all those juicy updates and moving on to the next big game that's based on a video game, we do have a date announced for Elden Ring and this is going to be launching on November 22nd. They also have the preview page up now so if you want to subscribe to this one you can go click to get notified and of course I'll be covering this one in a lot more detail in the week that it launches. And a brand new announcement we have is that there will be another campaign for Townsfolk Tussle. I expect this is either going to come later this year or early in 2023 but I believe this will introduce a brand new expansion and of course you will be able to get all the previous content. And another brand new announcement is that there is going to be another campaign for Teotuacan, which is going to be the Teotuacan Deluxe campaign. And this is going to offer a big box solution that will house your core game and all the expansions and of course all the deluxified components as well. And I'm sure there'll also be some new content and surprises mixed in there once this one launches and this one's expected for 2023. And finally just one small piece of news before we get started here and I thought this one was interesting because I am a bit of a fan of Iron Maiden but Kaman is introducing a lot of Iron Maiden and miniatures based on the artwork from all the different albums and this is going to be able to be mixed into mainly zombie side but it will also be supported for almost every other game that they have including massive darkness rising sun and cthulhu death may die and this isn't a kickstarter or anything you can just go ahead and pre-order this one if you're interested in it i just thought it was fun and come on does this sort of stuff all the time but i just particularly like this theme and thought it was worth mentioning but if you want any more updates or reviews or previews for any of these games coming to Kickstarter, you'll definitely want to check out Board Game Co. He offers a whole bunch of different videos covering all sorts of content, and we do work together to put together these lists, so I do appreciate you checking them out and giving him your support. He's also just a really great guy, and he just does an excellent job with his channel, so it's a win-win for everyone. And if you're over here watching my videos, you probably already watch his videos, but if you haven't checked him out yet, I do have links to his channel in the description below. And with all that out of the way, let's check out the Kickstarters because there are a lot of them. And the first campaign we have launches on October 17th and this one's called Delta and this plays 2-4 to four players and takes about 60-90 to 90 minutes to play. And there are quite a few games this week and quite a few to look forward to and I definitely think this is one of them. This one is a Euro style game that has a lot of elements of worker placement but instead of placing worker meeples you're actually going to be using character cards. And on your turn you're going to be assigning one of your character cards to one of the three areas of the main board. There's a left side that is the workshop that's going to allow you to build different inventions and gain new abilities. And then there is the center that will allow you to explore different areas of the world to gather resources and perform actions at whatever location that you stop at. And then there is the right hand side where you're going to be conducting different research which is going to move you up different research tracks so that if you research in a particular mechanical animal you're going to be gaining more victory points points for each of those mechanical animals that you're able to get into your possession. And yes, this is a steampunk themed game where mechanical animals are commonplace in the world and you're going to be gathering crystals to power up your machines, exploring the world, researching inventions, and creating them. But there are a few things that you're going to want to consider whenever you're placing one of these character cards. 
Obviously, you're going to want to place it in a location that you want to perform an action at, but those actions might require you to have certain resources. But the nice thing about placing the character cards is you're actually going to gain the resources that are outlined on the card. So this might dictate which character that you play because you might need the resources that they offer in order to perform the actions that you want. But not only that, but these characters will also gain you a presence at each of those three locations and whichever player has the most presence there is going to get first dibs of the different cards that are located at the top of that location. And these different cards could be new characters that you could recruit or they could be some more mechanical animals which will come with their own special bonus or special abilities or instead you could gain different objective cards which can grant you bonus victory points at the end of the game. Game plays over six rounds and the player who has the most victory points at the end of six rounds wins the game. And the next campaign we have is launching on October 18th and this is another exciting one because this is for a game that a ton of people already know and love. And this one was a close runner up to being our discord pick of the week this week. And this one is for the expansion for Spirit Island called Spirit Island Nature Incarnate. And if you're not familiar with Spirit Island, this is a one to four player cooperative game that takes about 90 to 120 minutes to play. And in this game, players are playing as different spirits that are trying to protect the island and its native inhabitants from invading colonies. There's going to be invader cards that you're flipping each round, and it's going to determine where the colonists invade on the map. Map, and then they're going to be expanding and building towns and cities and ravaging the land generating blight for each of the areas that they ravage on the board and also getting into fights with the natives and potentially wiping them out which can cost you the game and you do lose the game if the island is overrun with blight if you run out of invader cards to draw so you've went through the entire deck or if one of your player spirits has been fully wiped from the island but each player is going to be playing as their own asymmetrical spirit guarding the island each coming with their own play style and special abilities but essentially on a turn you're going to be choosing one of three main actions and in a nutshell these different actions allow you to do things like gain presence on the island while upgrading your max energy or cards getting your played cards back into your hand or even gaining new cards each spirit does come with their own individual deck of cards and players will be spending energy to play their cards and players will be using cards to perform their actions to manipulate the island harm the invaders fortify the natives and there will be a bit of deck building as well because you can add more cards into your hand. Some of the action cards will resolve quickly and you'll be able to use them before the invaders get to do anything during that round, but that some of your cards react slowly, which will occur after the invaders have had their turn. And this new expansion is going to be adding eight new spirits or more depending on the stretch goals, and it's going to be adding some new threats and a new incarnate resource and mechanisms for players to work into the game. And this is going to allow the spirits to use nature and titans to fight the invaders. There isn't a whole lot of info on this expansion it's been pretty hush hush but there will be a lot more info once the campaign launches so if this one does interest you you can check out the backer kit page and click that sign up button to get notified and i have links to all these campaigns in the description below and also launching on October 18th, we have Trench Club. And this plays one to four players and takes about 120 to 240 minutes to play. And this is a strategic war game where players are going to be playing as generals during the First World War. Players are going to gain an income at the start of each round, and then you're going to be using that to send out infantry, artillery, aircrafts, and tanks. And each unit is going to have its own attack and defense strength, as well as an ability to move through different terrain, and a special ability for you to take advantage of and to make each unit play a lot differently. And each game is going to start out with a whole bunch of different forts scattered across the map and these are going to be starting out as neutral forts but any player can take them over by transporting their infantry there and just getting one of their infantry units onto that fort. When you've claimed a fort it also acts as a location where you can spawn new units but the enemy can also take over that fort just as easy if they're able to get one of their infantry troops to that fort and that will destroy any of your units that you currently have within the fort if you allow that to happen. So if you do have a fort you're really going to want to make sure that you're defending it and not allowing an infantry unit to make its way inside. Combat in this game is resolved using dice rolling and the values that you need to roll in order to guarantee a hit are going to be dictated by the units that you have involved in that particular battle. And you will gain some bonus dice if you're able to flank your opponent or completely surround them, but your opponent will also be able to fight back as well and defend themselves with their own dice rolls. And the first player to control nine forts or completely wipe out their opponent or force their opponent opponent to surrender 
wins the game. And launching on October 18th, we have Barbarian Kingdoms, and this plays three to six players and takes about 30 to 90 minutes to play. And this one is also a strategic war game, but this one actually takes place back in about 450 AD, where players are playing as kings trying to take over Western Europe. And each round, there's a few different actions that players get to perform. First, you'll be able to pay in order to deploy warriors out on the map. You'll collect money from taxes for any of the kingdoms that you currently control, or players can reposition their units, or if they want they can try to take over one of the other provinces by fighting or bribing their way into control. And I think this game has really interesting combat. Obviously you're going to be gaining more strength for the units that you have involved in the combat. In order to include them they need to be adjacent to the province that you are trying to attack. But then each player is going to be choosing an amount of gold in secret that they're going to be giving to the other player whether or not they win or lose the battle. And then the winner of the battle is going to be determined by their total presence there as well as the gold that they were willing to sacrifice. So there's a little bit of bluffing going on here, which of course opens up the door to some creative attacks where maybe they know that they're going to lose and maybe intentionally are throwing the battle just to get some of your gold. But the first player to control seven territories or completely eliminate the other two kings wins the game. And also launching on October 18th, we have the reprint campaign for Oathsworn Into the Deepwood. And this plays one to four players and takes about 30 to 90 minutes to play. And if you're not familiar with this game, this is a cooperative campaign game where players are going to be playing asymmetrical characters, each with their own special ability, their own deck of cards that you can change, modify, and upgrade throughout the campaign. And this is a campaign that you're always going to be playing with four characters, regardless of how many players you actually have at the table. But one thing that I think is really interesting about this, and one of the reasons that this one is my own personal pick of the week is because of the options that it gives the players. If you're playing with less than four players, then you're going to have at least one player playing multiple characters, but the game also gives you a simplified version of each character so that if you don't want that overhead of playing multiple characters, you can actually just play one of the characters as your main character and the actions of your secondary character will be a little bit more automated and simplified so you don't have to worry about them as much, but it will still keep the game balanced. And of course, this game comes with some fantastic miniatures but there is also a unique aspect to them because each of the miniatures has swappable arms and weapons so that as you find new weapons throughout the campaign you can actually swap those parts out on your miniature to match whatever type of weapon you currently have. And the game offers over 20 different chapters that each take about two to three hours to play and each chapter is going to be taking place over two phases. Your first phase is going to have more choose your own adventure type aspects where you're going to be exploring areas on the board, engaging in different points of interest and making decisions that are going to affect the campaign moving forward and affect what sort of resources and abilities you have available to you when you go and fight that final boss. And one thing that I really love about this, and it's one of the reasons that I made this my pick of the week, is that this phase is actually completely skippable. And I know a lot of you might think, I don't really want to skip parts of the game. I want to play the entire game through and through. And maybe a lot of you will do that, but I also know that a lot of us probably aren't able to play over 20 different chapters. And if you start feeling like you're getting to the point where you're not able to finish the campaign, I think this is just a really great option to kind of blast through the more exciting parts of the game. And it still does update you on the story. It's just gonna be a little bit more on rails. So you're gonna be missing out on a few of the decision-making aspects, but you will still get that full story and that full campaign. And I do think in general, you will get more out of the game if you're actually able to complete it. Even if you're not able to do every single thing. But it's this point in the game where there are a lot of decisions that go in multiple different branching arcs that can tell a completely different story depending on what your decisions are. And there are a ton of options here, but the catch is that there is only limited time. You're only able to make a few actions each phase, which is going to limit you to a subset of the options that are available. So even if you do play each of these phases, you still won't see everything, which also does put you in a great position to play the game a second time if you do ever find the time. And the game is going to come with a whole bunch of booklets that will provide the narrative of the game and also present different decisions and provide outcomes to those decisions depending on how the players perform. But I just can't emphasize enough how much this game tailors to the different play styles and different preferences for the different players that might be playing this game because if you're not interested in reading the narrative yourself there is also a companion app that you can use instead and a really cool thing Thing about this is that it is completely narrated by James Cosmo from Game of Thrones 
So if you want to feel like you're in the Night's Watch, there is always an option for that. But as players make their decisions and the narrative unfolds, you're inevitably going to be getting into a boss battle. And the game offers all sorts of boxes that are going to have all sorts of different miniatures within them. And these are going to be discovered slowly as you're exploring the game, but most of them are going to be deadly beasts that are trying to kill you. And although I think they did a whole bunch of stuff right with everything else in the game, this is really where the meat of the game lies. And this is really where players are going to feel the weight of their decisions and if they paid off or put them in a worse position. And of course, this is where the game starts to get a little bit more high stakes because this is where players can actually be defeated. And the way that combat works in this game is that there's both a spatial element as well as a hand management element. Players are going to move around the board trying to attack the enemy and get in opportune positions because there are going to be weak spots but then where you're standing relative to the enemy might also provoke certain attacks because if you're standing in front of them you're more likely to get bitten but if you're standing behind them you might be more likely to get tail whipped. But in order to actually attack or defend, players are going to be spending energy tokens in order to activate their combat cards. And these can have all sorts of different effects for you to take advantage of, but each card's also going to have a number on it. And that essentially determines how long that card's going to be out of play until you can use it again, but there are some ways to manipulate this. When dealing damage, players can either choose to roll dice or draw cards, and there is a push your luck aspect here because you can roll as many dice as you want or draw as many cards as you want, but if you happen to get too many blanks, then it's going to bust and your attack is going to completely miss. And if you prefer dice over cards or cards over dice, you can just continue to use one or the other, but just know that using the cards will be a little bit more balanced because there's only a set number of each value within the deck of cards, whereas with the dice anything's possible anytime you roll a die, so you can get a lot more swingy results, but you also have opportunity to get some really big hits. The game also features exploding dice, so if you're rolling a certain icon, it will allow you to roll another die for free. And these are really nice because even if you do roll blanks, they won't cause you to bust. And you can also potentially roll more exploding dice, which will cascade and cause you to roll even more dice, which can really ramp up to some amazing attacks. Each boss is different in this game and they'll each have their own abilities, strengths, and weaknesses. And some of the bosses can even go through multiple phases where different events or transformations can happen as the battle progresses. The new campaign is primarily focused on the second edition reprint of the first game where all the original pledge levels will be available plus a few new extras as well. And for returning backers there will be an upgrade pack that brings a new pair of rulebooks, some new ability cards, and some new special ability rule boards that will tighten up the existing encounters. And if you're not interested in paying for that there is also a digital version provided as well but if you do want to buy the upgrade and you are a returning backer you will get a 10% discount and there will be a brand new secret box that's free to all the first day backers so if this one does sound interesting to you you'll definitely want to subscribe so that you don't miss out on that freebie and I probably should have said this earlier but this one is also our discord pick of the week and there's no surprise there a ton of excitement around this game definitely recommend checking it out and you can find links in the description below and also launching on October 18th, we have Wonky Wheels, and this plays 2-6 to six players and takes about 30-45 to 45 minutes to play. And this is a competitive racing game that's inspired by games like Mario Kart. And in this game, you'll be able to set up all sorts of modular boards. Then each player is going to have their own personal player sheet, which they're going to use to track the stats of their vehicle. And there's three different stats that you're tracking. There's your health, your steering, and your tires. And your tires kind of act as a modifier to the other two stats. And players can also make a pit stop if they feel like they're getting a little bit low in those stats. But of course, that does come with the cost of time. The players are going to be racing around the modular map, picking up any power-ups that they cross over, and these can also be used to upgrade the stats of your vehicles, but they can also grant you some special abilities that could harm your opponents or help yourself. Players are each going to start the game with a deck of identical movement cards, and you're always going to have three in your hand. These are going to offer you a combination of steering and movement forward, and each player is going to be choosing one of these and then revealing it in order to perform their action, in addition to any ability cards that they want to play on their turn. Players will then draw another movement card into their hand at the end of the turn and the game continues like this until a player has completed the amount of laps for the race and then that player will win the game. And also launching on October 18th we have Trickshot 2nd Edition and this plays 2-4 to four players and takes about 30-60 to 60 minutes to play and this is a hockey themed board game where players are playing competitively to try and get as many goals before the time runs out and the player with the most goals at the end of the game of course wins the game but the way this game works is that it uses a push your luck mechanism and I really like the way that this mechanism works because you can take as many actions as you like on your turn but every time you take an action you're going to be rolling dice in order to determine if it's a success and if you happen to 
roll an X, then that is going to count as a failure. Each time you perform an action, you're going to be adding one more dice to your pool, making it more and more likely that you do roll an X. And there's all sorts of actions you can take in order to skate around the board, body check the opponent players to try and steal the puck, pass the puck to your teammates, or even try to take a slap shot on the net. But the other catch here is that you can never activate the same character twice in a row. So as you're performing these actions, you're always going to be choosing a new hockey player to activate that was different than the one before. But players will have some options to re-roll their dice or continue to roll even if they did happen to roll a failure. But you're only able to do this a certain amount of times on your turn by exhausting certain cards. And if you happen to fail again after all of these cards have been exhausted, then you're not going to get them all refreshed on your following turn, which is going to make your next play a lot more risky. But it doesn't stop there because you're also going to get additional repercussions for failing depending on which action you're performing when you had that failure. But even if you don't roll a failure, there still are some icons on the dice that can cause some other unexpected events, like allowing your opponent player to have actions during your turn, or even like hitting the puck just a little bit too hard. But luckily players can also gain ability cards to gain some special actions that they can use to their advantage throughout the game and the player with the most points at the end of the game wins. Also launching on the 18th, we have a campaign that's going to be launching four different games, and these are all really quick, easy, fun games to play that are great for a party setting. And the first one is called Categorical. And this plays two to seven players and takes about four to 12 minutes to play. And in this game, you're going to be using a deck of cards that's going to have two letters on it, and players are going to be choosing a category at the start of the game, and then they're just going to be flipping up a card that has those two letters, and the first team or player to say a word that fits in that category, but also starts with one of those letters is going to score a point and then they get that card and the first player to get a certain amount of cards is going to win the game. And the second game in this campaign is called a game about counting cats shapes and colors that keep getting trickier and this plays two to eight players and takes about two to ten minutes to play and the name of the game pretty much explains it. The way that this game works is that you're going to be using a deck of cards. On one side of the cards there's going to be three cats of different shapes and colors and then on the other side of the card there's going to be either a shape or a color. Players are going to flip a card and if it's a shape of a cat they're going to have to say the number of visible cats that match that shape, but if it's a color you have to say the number of visible cats that match that color. Whatever team does this first is going to gain that card and then you're going to be flipping it so the three cats are face up, which is going to add even more cats to keep track of as you're flipping the cards. The first team to get five cards wins the game. And the third game is called a game about quickly matching words and pictures, but never words to words and never pictures to pictures. And this plays two to five players and takes about five to ten minutes to play. And of these four games, I think this one is my absolute favorite. I think this one is actually because this game just uses a single deck of cards and each of the cards will either be a picture of something of a certain color, while the other cards will just be a word of that picture or a word of a color. And one of the players is just going to be taking that deck and then cutting it out on the table into multiple decks. And anytime that a player or team can match two cards together by matching a word with either the color of the picture or the image on the picture, that player is going to earn a point. But this is where things get interesting because you're going to be taking both those cards, but since you're cutting the deck and creating multiple decks, as soon as you take those two cards, you're going to be revealing two more cards underneath them. And this can cause a cascading effect where more opportunities come up and players are racing to try and get those cards and the team to make the most matches is going to win the game. And the last game of this campaign is another interesting one because this one is quite a bit different from all the other games and this one's a game about drawing creatures, complementing the drawings, and then complementing the complements. And this plays five players and takes about 15-20 minutes to play. And the way this game works is that you're going to be drawing three cards for each player and then you're going to have a communal card in the center of the table and each player is going to have to draw a picture including all four of the cards that they have in front of them. Each player is then going to take turns presenting their drawing and then every other player has to give a compliment and then the player that presented their drawing is going to choose one of those compliments to give a compliment back to. And that's pretty much everything there is to the game. You don't really win or lose this game unless you're not really good at giving or taking compliments, but it's just a fun activity to pass the time with your friends and have a good laugh. And of course, if you're interested in any or all of these games, you can find out more in the description below. And also launching on the 18th, we have Ocean's Legends of the Deep, and this plays 2-4 to four players and takes about 60-90 to 90 minutes to play, and this is an expansion to the game Oceans, which if you're not familiar with, is a competitive game where players are competing to have the most fish. And the way this works is that players are going to be playing cards in order to migrate fish to their boards, or to create a new species of fish by taking a fish board and putting it in front of them, and assigning one of the cards to that board. Or if you already have one of those boards out, you can also add more traits to an existing species. 
And the placement of your different fish species relative to each other does matter because there is adjacency between them and even adjacency between your fish and your opponent's fish. And a lot of the different species that you'll create will have traits that can be affected by the fish adjacent to them or can affect or attack those fish themselves. And the fish board that's associated with your fish species represents their population and you can increase this by attacking other players successfully or by foraging for more fish. There's also some special ways through abilities that you might be able to modify this, but if you ever end up filling up your board, you actually overpopulate, which is detrimental to your species and cuts your population in half. And in addition to that, each round your fish are going to age, which is going to cost you one population from each of your species of fish. And if that population ever runs out, then that species of fish is going to go extinct and you're going to be removing it from the table. And a really neat aspect about this game is that about halfway through you're going to be experiencing the Cambrian Explosion, which was a historical period in time where evolution was happening very rapidly. When this happens in the game, you're going to be moving essentially twice as fast because you're going to be able to draw two cards each turn, but then at the end of each turn you're going to be losing two population per species. This also allows players to access the traits of the Deep Sea Fish, which will have some more advanced abilities. And this new expansion is going to be adding more mythical and fantastical creatures into the game. At the start of the game, each player is going to be drafting four of these new legend cards. And these cards are going to have game-changing abilities and global effects. And during your turn, you'll have the option to play one of these cards in addition to your normal card play. And you can also pay the difference between two cards if you want to swap out your old legend card for a new one. This is another game that was a very close runner up for our discord pick of the week and if you're interested in this one you can find links to it in the description below and you can also download this game on your mobile phone i believe it's free so if you do want to try it before you buy it that's also a great option and also launching on october 18th we have super snipers and this plays one to two players and takes about 20 to 30 minutes to play and this is a polyomino game where each player is a sniper trying to take out their opponent and the way that this game works is that each player is going to have three different locations that they can choose to hide in and then the opposing player is going to be placing polyominoes from their bag onto one of the three locations until they've surrounded the center location on one of those tiles and once they've done that the other player will have to reveal whether or not that is the tile that they were hiding at and each Player will be doing this simultaneously but once a player does locate the location of the other player then you're going to be moving your attention onto the larger player board. The first few tiles represented you locating the opposing player but the second tile represents you taking aim and taking the shot. And this one works the exact same way where you're going to be drawing tiles from your polyomino bag and placing them out on the board. Covering certain icons while you do this can grant you some special bonuses, but you're also going to be avoiding different areas of the board because you don't want to hit any bystanders. And whenever you're placing tiles, you always have to start from the perimeter of the board and then place a tile that is adjacent to a previously placed tile. But what makes the second board just a little bit more difficult is that not only do you have to surround the location of your opponent player like you did in the location card, but you also then have to fill the void that you created while you surrounded them with a single polyomino. So you're going to be trying to surround them to create a shape that you think you have a high likelihood of finding a polyomino that will fit into. And once you've done that, you've landed one hit successfully and then you're going to reset the round. Then the game continues like this until a single player lands three hits, and then that player is going to win the game. Also launching on the 18th, we have Escape from New York, and this plays 1-4 to four players, it takes about 40-90 to 90 minutes to play, and this is a cooperative adaptation of the John Carpenter movie with the same name, which if you're not familiar with, takes place in a world where New York was turned into a giant prison, where all the most dangerous criminals are kept, and they all have life sentences because once you enter this prison, you never leave, and there's no guards or anything, this whole prison is just allowed to live in whatever society they create for themselves which, spoiler alert, is not a great one. But the president's plane was hijacked and flown into this prison, so it's your job to try and get him out. And players will be able to choose different characters from the movie, each with their own special ability. And although the game is cooperative, it does get progressively more difficult, and at a certain point it might make more sense to try and save yourself than to try and work with the others to try and save the president. And once it does reach this point, players will have their own personal objective that if they're able to fulfill it, they will escape the prison on their own, leaving all the players behind to lose the game. And of course there will be different types of enemies that will show up out on the board. There's basic prisoners that start out weak, but they do get strong 
stronger in numbers and can level up as the game progresses. And there are the more stronger bosses that have their own stats and special abilities. And combat in this game is done using cards, but there will be a cost to get those cards back later. On a player's turn, there's going to be two different phases. There's the hero phase, where you're going to be playing your cards to perform actions, and you'll be revealing any tiles as you move around the board, revealing different roadblocks, enemies, or events as you're trying to search for a specific tile that is the location of the president. Players will start with all their cards available to them in their hand, but as you're spending them, they are exhausted and you're going to have to perform an action in order to get them back. But each action is also going to create a certain amount of noise, which is going to move up the noise tracker, which is relevant for the next phase, which is the city phase. And the city phase always begins with revealing a card from the city deck, and every one of these cards is going to have a value on it, which represents a certain amount of noise. And if your noise tracker is equal or above that value, then you're going to resolve the events of that card. And this can move around or upgrade enemies, cause different events that can be harmful or beneficial to the players, or even advance time where you're going to be drawing from the time deck, which eventually will be the end trigger for the game, but can also cause other events. And of course, players lose the game if the time deck runs out before they're able to rescue the president. And there's a few different bosses that players can mix into the game, changing up the whole feel of the game because each boss is going to come with their own deck, which is going to be drawn and dictate how the different enemies interact with the players, what sort of abilities they have, and what sort of strength and weaknesses they have. And these cards don't just affect the boss, but they'll also affect how all the enemies interact and behave on the board creating a lot of variability from game to game. And if players are able to escape the prison with the president or escape on their own if things get a little too hairy, then the players or that player will win the game. And also launching on October 18th, we have War Crow Adventures. And this plays two to four players and takes about 60 to 90 minutes to play. And this is a cooperative narrative dungeon crawler with asymmetrical characters, each with their own abilities and individual decks of cards. And this is a scenario based game where you're going to be fighting different enemies throughout the scenario, eventually leading up to a final boss. Players will be choosing a scenario that they want to play, and then you'll be using the companion app, which will provide narrative, then also provide instructions on how to set up the scenario, and I'll also walk you through the gameplay and remember the decisions that the players make and the effects that it has on the scenario moving forward. And a really neat thing about this game is that there's not really a set turn order and instead players and enemies will be taking their turns in initiative order. And the way this works is that you're going to be using this really neat dial here and players are going to have their player tokens as well as enemy tokens out on this dial and depending on your initiative you're going to be going on a certain location on the dial and then the dial is going to be rotating to indicate which player's turn it is. What makes this dial so cool is that you can perform different actions to try and speed up you or your teammates turns and try to slow down the turns of the enemies. But on a player's turn, they're going to be spending their energy to activate their cards and perform various actions, often interacting with different points on the map and using the app to present the options that each point of interest does provide. And whenever you do this, you're normally going to be provided with a few different options, each with their own skill tests that you can try to complete. And depending on your stats, some of these might be easier than others, but you're also going to be doing some dice rolling and dice manipulation to try and increase your odds. And exploring the map will also reveal or attract different enemies in combat in this game is done with dice rolling. You'll also be able to use your cards and abilities to try and tip the scale in your favor. Not a whole lot of info on this one right now, but if you want to know more, you can check out the campaign. I have links to that in the description below. And the next campaign we have launching on October 18th is the next game from Chip Theory Games. And this one is actually a solo game that takes about 20 to 30 minutes to play. And this one is called 20 Strong, the Solar Sentinels. And in this game, players are going to be using just 20 dice as they're trying to get through an entire deck of cards. And if they're able to get through that deck of cards, they win the game. And each card in the deck is going to have a different challenge for the player to try and complete. And the player is going to be rolling 17 dice of varying hit probabilities, trying to roll enough successes to complete that challenge. And if they're able to do so, they will move on to the next card and also get the rewards of that card. But there's also three stats that the player is going to have to track, and these are your health, your rerolls, and your recovery stats. And you're going to be tracking these by using three separate dice, where your health is obviously your health, and if you get to zero before you get through the deck, then you lose the game. Your rerolls is the number of dice that you're allowed to try to reroll for each challenge. And then your recovery is how many rolled dice you can recover each round, which means that if you're rolling more than that amount, you won't be 
getting those back to use in your future challenges. So you can start to see that as you're going through the deck and trying to complete these different challenges, there's going to be times where you're going to want to roll more dice than what you are capable of, which means that you're going to be slimming down your pool as the game goes on. And this campaign is going to be offering three different decks, each with their own unique mechanisms and themes. And the first one is the main deck, which is the Solar Sentinels theme, which looks like it's going to be taking place out in space. And then there is also a Too Many Bones theme and a Hoplomachus theme. So if you're familiar with some of the previous games from Chip Theory Games, you will be able to play this game within those worlds. And if this one sounds interesting to you, you can find links in the description below. Also launching on October 18th, we have Street Fighter V Champion Edition Legends. And this plays one to four players and takes about 30 to 90 minutes to play. And this is a scenario-based cooperative game where players are going to be choosing a scenario and then also choosing one of the many nemesises, nemesis, nemesi, and then mixing them together to create the setup for the game. Each nemesis is going to come with its own nemesis deck, making it feel a lot different than the others. And also they're each going to come with their own double-sided board that gets flipped over midway through the game, with the second side being more difficult than the first. And of course, each player is going to be able to choose their own character to play, and each character is going to come with a board to track their health and experience, as well as their ability tiles, which are used to activate the character's special moves. And these tiles are also double-sided with a more powerful version of that attack on the backside, and you'll be able to flip that if you can upgrade it at some point in the game. And players also have a single more powerful special ability that you'll also be trying to unlock. And a neat thing about this game is that each character is unique, but you can also mix them with any style deck, so you can mix and match them however you like, creating a very different feel even if you're playing the same character as before. And not only is there a nemesis that all the players are going to be fighting against, but there is also going to be a rival for each individual player. And there's going to be a whole bunch of rivals that you can choose from, and each player can just choose who they want their rival to be, or you can draw them randomly. By the way this game works is that each turn you're going to be drawing four cards from your cell deck and these are going to give you different movement or ranged and melee attacks or even just allow you to increase your experience meter. Attacks in this game are resolved using dice rolling, but you can spend your experience tokens in order to issue some rerolls. And the way that the enemies work in this game is pretty interesting because the weaker minions are going to be moving after each player has had a turn, whereas the more stronger rival enemies are going to be moving after all the players have had their turn. At this point, players are also going to draw a nemesis card, which can spawn more enemies, move enemies around, and cause them to perform special attacks, depending on what nemesis you have. And the nemesis doesn't actually start on the board at the beginning of the game, but they will be spawned onto the board after you've gone through their nemesis deck just once. And one thing to note about this game is that the game was designed by Blacklist Games, but then Colossal Games bought exclusive rights in order to print and sell it, but they only bought the rights for a single print run. So Colossal Games is saying that there's only ever going to be one print run. I don't know if they're able to buy the rights again to do another print run, but it sounds like this is only going to Kickstarter and there's not going to be another opportunity to get it in the future. So if this one does sound interesting to you, then you might want to check it out. And I have links in the description below. Also launched on October 18th, we have Hero or Villain Battle Royale. And this plays two to five players and takes about 10 to 20 minutes to play. And this is a card combat bluffing game. So in this game, each player is going to be choosing a character card of either a hero or a villain. And your character card is going to have a few different icons on it, dictating what type of cards that character can use. But on your turn, you can play as many cards from your hand as you like. But like I said, you want to be matching up the icons with your character with the cards that you're going to play. Each player also is choosing their character in secret, so no other player really knows if you are following that rule, and bluffing is allowed. And any other player that suspects you can challenge you, and if you are indeed bluffing, then that's going to cost you some cards. And at the end of each turn, you're also going to be drawing a card back into your hand, but if you ever draw the demolition card and you have no cards to defend yourself, then you are eliminated from the game. And when that card's drawn, it just goes back into the deck so that it can continue to be drawn throughout the game. And of course the other cards you'll get will allow you to harm the other players or help yourself and the player who is the last player standing wins the game. And the next campaign that we have launching on the 18th is called Deep Shelf and this one plays one to four players and takes about 90 to 120 minutes to play. And this is a campaign that I am super excited about. I think this one's going to have really solid gameplay. Just from looking into the game it looks like a lot of fun but also this is coming from the same publisher that created a game that you might know as Dinogenics which was a bit of a sleeper hit. I didn't know what to expect when I first heard about it but this is a game that a ton of people really like. A lot of people have heard about this game and you might have even recognized it as well as soon as I said it but I don't think many people 
people know about this publisher or recognize this publisher's name. So I think this one could potentially also be another sleeper hit. There's not a whole lot of games released by this publisher yet for them to really have a track record of quality games, but just from looking into the gameplay of this one, I think it does look like a solid game. In this game, players are playing as corporations harvesting resources from the ocean floor, and players are going to have to balance how greedy they want to be because you will have an impact on the ecosystem, which is going to speed up the end of the game. The neat thing about this game is that there are three main paths to victory, but they all kind of stack on top of each other. You can either go for metal extraction, which is used for building your network throughout the ocean, and it's also used for research and can also just be converted into victory points. And the second way is through your research progression, and you can advance this by constructing labs and then performing research to advance your ecology, mineralogy, or zoology. And doing this will give you an immediate reward, but it can also give permanent upgrades. Making new discoveries by extracting unknown species from the ocean floor is also another way to move your research progression up, and you're going to be gaining victory points for moving up that research track. And the final main way to gain victory points is through area control by having the most structures in each of the three sections of the main board. And one thing that really stood out to me on the design on this one and how I know that the designer really knows what he's doing is because this does have quite a few really neat catch-up mechanics. Anytime a player advances in any of their tracks, it's going to give positive benefits to the other players. But then there is also a sea monster that's protective of the ocean floor and it's going to cause havoc to the greedy players and it will be able to be moved around, usually by the players that are being less greedy. In each turn, players are going to be choosing two actions to perform from their individual player boards. Each player board will have the same actions, but they might be a little bit different from player to player. And you can use any action that's available to you, but you can never use one of the actions that were used in a previous turn, so there's always going to be two actions that are out of bounds. And these actions allow you to do different things like move your submarine around on the board and scout for new tiles, gain income, construct buildings or vehicles, or move those vehicles around on the board, extract resources, refine ore, or conduct research. And the player with the most victory points at the end of the game wins the game. And the next campaign launching on the 18th is called Dreadful Meadows, and this plays 1-4 to four players and takes about 30-60 to 60 minutes to play, and in this game players are spooky candy farmers. Players are going to be trying to build up their farm and grow different candy crops, and they're going to be taking turns performing an action. And the different actions players can take is to purchase a patch of land of a different candy crop and then place it into their farm, or they can purchase a harvester and plant it onto a patch of land to generate more candy, or they can place one of those sprites from their board onto a patch of land, and this is going to cause the board to grow candy on each of the adjacent patches. And the neat thing about these sprites is that they can also cause chaining effects, so if there's any harvesters on those adjacent tiles, then those are also going to generate candy. And then if there's any harvesters around those harvesters, then they also get activated, and this will continue chaining until there are no more to be activated. And the last action you can do is to take one of your sprites back and put it back on your board. Whenever you do this, it's going to activate a special ability of whichever tile that you're taking that sprite from. And this can grant you all sorts of different bonuses, but mainly allows you to get concoction cards, which kind of act like objective cards, where you're trying to get different combinations of candy. And that'll grant you some victory points at the end of the game. And the player who has the most victory points will win the game, and you're going to be gaining victory points not only from your concoction cards, but also having groups of patches of the same candy, and also from the number of hard harvesters and leftover candy that you have at the end of the game. And of course you can find more info in the description below. And also launching on October 18th we have Canvas Finishing Touches and this plays 1-5 to five players and takes about 30 minutes to play and this is an expansion to the game Canvas which if you're not familiar with it is a game all about creating art and the way that this game works is that the game uses see-through cards that each have an image on it and players are going to be combining up to three of these to create their own work of art and they're going to be sliding that into a sleeve that has some sort of artistic background on it to pull it all together. Players are going to be combining different icons on these cards in order to score victory points within the cards themselves, but then there will also be different objectives that players are going for in order to try and score even more victory points. Players will be gaining their cards from a row in the center of the table, and you can take any card that you want, but the leftmost one is free, and any card that you go right of that card, you're going to have to add a token to. And of course, if you take a card that has tokens on it, then you can gain those tokens. And this expansion is going to be adding one more layer to your works of art because it's going to be now adding frames that you can mix and match with your different art pieces and pairing the appropriate frame with the perfect work of art is going to add another puzzle for players to consider. And of course the expansion will also be adding some new cards that you can mix into the game and you will be able to get the core game in this campaign as well. 
And the next campaign we have also launching on the 18th is for Aqua Garden, the Beachcombing expansion. And this plays one to four players and takes about 40 to 60 minutes to play. And of course, this is an expansion to the game Aqua Garden, which if you're not familiar with it, is a game where players are competing to create the most beautiful aquarium. And the way that this game works is that players are going to be taking one action on their turn. They can either take a fish or they can place an advertisement. If you choose to take a fish, you're going to be able to put it on your own personal player board by putting it in one of your six aquariums. The only catch here is that you're going to have a meeple moving around the board and you're only able to put a fish into an aquarium that's adjacent to that meeple. Fish tanks also have a size limit, but of course mixing certain fish are going to allow you to score victory points in different ways. And this new expansion is going to be adding all sorts of beach items to the game like starfish, clams, and messages in a bottle. And the way that these work is that they're going to be randomly placed out paired up with the different fish that you're able to draft and then this is going to add another element added to your decision making with choosing a fish because you're also going to get that beach combing item then you'll be able to place that in your aquarium as well which is going to gain you victory points for attaining certain combinations and something really cool about how these beach combing items work is that they'll actually pair together and lock in with your existing fish meeples which will create some really cute effects and the next campaign launching on the 18th is called Race to the Raft, and this plays one to four players and takes about 40 to 60 minutes to play. And this one is actually a cooperative game that takes place in the Isle of Cats universe, where players are going to be trying to rescue the cats from a burning island and trying to get all the cats off before the island is fully engulfed in flames. The game offers over 80 different scenarios for players to try and complete, and players are going to be drafting three cards into their hand, but these cards are always kept secret from each other. These cards will have different colored terrain on them, and you're going to be trying to match these terrains together in order to create paths because the cats will only walk on the terrain that matches their color. Players are allowed to talk, you just can't tell the other players which cards you have, so players are going to have to go off of which player they're most confident of, and there is no player order, so you can just decide which player can play the next card. Of course, you can also choose to move a cat down a path, but you're going to want to balance when you do this because if you create a longer path to start, then that movement will be a lot longer because you can move all the way down a single path as long as it's fully connected. So you're going to be balancing trying to make the paths as long as possible before you move the cat because that's going to maximize your number of actions. But you don't want to let the cat get too close to the fire because if any cat gets captured in the fire then you all lose the game. And when you do move a cat you just have to discard one card from your hand and the fire is going to spread any time that a card is placed on the board or any time that four cards are discarded. And when the fire spreads one player is going to be drawing a fire polyomino from the draw bag and then putting that on the board someplace connected to an existing fire. And if the players are able to get all the cats off the board before the fire gets in their way, then the players win the game. And the next campaign on the 18th is actually going to be offering two different games, and these are Twinkle Starship and Planet E2C. And Twinkle Starship plays four to three players and takes about 30 to 50 minutes to play. And this is a trick-taking game. And this one actually has a really neat mechanism that I haven't ever seen before because you'll actually be able to modify the numbers on your cards by putting different tokens on them. So you could change a zero into an eight by putting a token down the center, or you could turn a one into something like a three or a four by adding multiple tokens to that card. And winning your tricks does work as normal, but this one also has a really interesting way that it scores because you're going to be starting with a certain number of those tokens, and once you spend them, they are used and gone from your pool. But you're only going to be able to score victory points if the number of tokens that you have left matches the number of tricks that you've won. So you're going to want to try and use these tokens sparingly to try and maximize the amount of points that you can get, but also not using them is going to make it harder to win tricks, so there is a bit of a balance there. And if you have used up enough tokens so that it already matches is the number of tricks that you have, then you're going to be working really hard trying not to win any more tricks for the rest of the game. This actually sounds like a really fun trick-taking game to me because I think that mechanism alone is going to create a lot of really tense and hilarious moments. And the next game in the campaign is Planet E2C, and this plays two to three players and takes about 20 to 30 minutes to play. And this is a game where you're just trying to eliminate all the cards from your hand. And the way that this game works is that each card is going to have a number and a color associated with it. And certain colors are going to be higher in rank than other colors. And of course, certain numbers are higher than other numbers. But players are going to be going around in a circle playing their cards, and you always have to play a card that's a higher rank than the card before. 
but you can't decide whether you're playing a higher number or a higher color because it's actually dictated by whatever the previous player did. So if the previous player played a higher number than the card before them, then you also have to play a higher number. But if the previous player played a card that was both a higher number and a higher color, then you can choose, which gives you a little bit more flexibility. But if you're not able to do anything, then you're going to have to pass, and this will go around the table until all players have passed, and then the player who last played a card gets to start the next round. And when you start a round, you have the choice to play one card or a pair of matching cards. And if you play a pair, then all the other players also have to play pairs moving forward, and the game continues as normal. And the player that gets rid of all their cards first wins the game, and you can find links to these games in the description below. Also launching on the 18th, we have Unluckables, and this plays 2-6 to six players and takes about 30-60 to 60 minutes to play. And this is a card game where players are going to be playing cards into a tableau. Creature cards are going to have a cost associated with them, but then they also have a value. And in order to meet the requirements of the cost, it just means that you have to have enough creatures already in your tableau that have a value that adds up to that cost or more. Each card can also have an unlock value, which is going to cause you to draw that many cards from the unlock deck, which can have some negative or positive effects. And each card can also have a special ability that could be activated on certain events or conditions, or it could be one-time use per turn, or it could even be a passive ability that's always in effect. And players can also gain item cards, which they can add to one of their creatures to augment their abilities. The players are going to be taking turns performing three actions, and the actions that you have to choose from are to draw a new card into your hand, play a card into your tableau, discard a card from your hand in order to reduce the cost of the next card that you play, activate one of your abilities, or trade with another player. The end of the game is triggered as soon as one player has a total value of cards played into their tableau of 13 or more, and then the player with the most points at the end of the game wins the game. And now for a game launching on the 19th, we have Monty Python's co-curricular medieval reenactment program. And this is actually an RPG, not really a board game, so I'm not going to get into this one as much. In fact, I'm not going to get into it at all because there are too many games this week and I didn't have time to look into this one. So if you're interested in RPGs and you love Monty Python, you'll definitely want to check this one out. And there are links for more information in the description below. <laughs> And launching on October 20th, we have Pompero, and this plays 1-4 to four players and takes about 60-150 to 150 minutes to play. And if you are a fan of really crunchy Euros, I think this is definitely one that you'll want to check out. This one looks like a bit of a heavier game that's going to be offering you all sorts of different options to help you gain victory points, and this is a worker placement, hand management, and area control type game. And in this game, players are going to be starting with a hand of 8 action cards, player board, electrical towers, transformers, wind farms, and bulldozers. In each round, you're going to be taking turns performing three actions from your action cards, and you're going to be playing those cards into a slot on your player board in order to activate them. But each slot on your player board is also associated with one or two regions on the map, which are outlined with different letters such as A, B, or C. And if the slot allows you to choose between two regions, you're going to be covering up one of those regions with your card, revealing the one that you want your card to affect. Depending on the card you play and where you play it into your player board, you might also have to pay a cost. But some cards can also be upgraded with different bonus tokens that you can play onto that card to augment it. And you can choose to play the card to the top or bottom of your board, but you always have to play your cards from left to right. And if you want to take all your cards back, that counts as an action. Or if there's nothing that you really want to do, you can also just pass, which will get you a extra battery. And after all players have had their turn, it's going to trigger the end of the round where each player is going to be able to take one card back from their tableau. And then you're also going to generate income depending on how you've performed so far and what you've been able to build out on the main board. And the main actions that these cards are going to offer is to allow players to place a wind farm on a location that has a bulldozer. And you can play it to a location with your own bulldozer. And in that case, you're going to be paying to the bank. But if you play to a location that has an opponent's bulldozer, then you're going to have to pay to them. So you do want to try and position your bulldozer in a location where you think other players might find them useful. Or instead you might be able to build an electrical tower and this works the same way, we're going to be building it at a bulldozer, but these will also net you bonus tokens which you can use to augment your actions in the future. Some of the cards might also give you the opportunity to fulfill different contracts by spending energy or batteries to meet its conditions, and other cards might gain you additional money by gaining investments. But where this game really gets crunchy is because almost every single thing you do has an effect, whether you're placing a token or taking a token off your board, 
because you're going to be able to take tokens off different locations in order to get bonuses or maybe if you take an entire row or an entire column or some sort of pattern that will also activate certain bonuses that you'll want to take advantage of at certain points in the game and these little mini games will create all sorts of other opportunities that you won't have access to otherwise like even adding more action cards into your hand or gaining income milestones in the different income categories and if this is a game that sounds interesting to you, there's definitely a lot more to dig into. So you'll want to check out the campaign, which I'll have linked in the description below. And also launching on the 20th, we have Age of Champagne. And this plays one to four players. It takes about 30 to 120 minutes to play. And I couldn't find too much info on this one. There are some videos, but they're in French. And unfortunately, I'm not very good at French. So I wasn't able to find exactly how this game played. But this looks like it's going to be a worker placement where players are going to be building up their wineries, farming different grapes to produce the best champagne. Unfortunately, that's all the info I have on this one. But if you're a fan of champagne and Euro games, you can check out more info in the description below. And I hope that was enough campaigns for you because those are all the campaigns I have for you this week. But don't leave yet because we do have a couple awesome giveaways to announce. And the first one is going to be for 7C City of the Five Sales. And all you have to do to enter these giveaways is leave a comment down below. You don't have to like, you don't have to subscribe. But if you do like these videos and if you do want to see if you won next week, it's probably a good idea. And this giveaway is going to be for a pledge for the game. And if you're not familiar with this game, this is a pirate themed card battler that has you issuing cards into different areas of the board. There's going to be three different cities that players can issue cards to and there is a bit of an area control aspect there as well because you can try to take control of those cities and while you do have control it's going to gain you a point towards potentially winning the game but you can also gain victory points as well by playing certain cards and having them in play and if you ever are able to gain seven victory points then you win the game but you can also win the game by defeating all the other players opponents leader cards or by controlling all three cities that are out on the board and something that makes this game really attractive to me is the way that the turns take place you're gonna be playing two cards on each of your turns one is gonna be a character card that's gonna go immediately into play but the other one is a scheme card and this is gonna have a value on it dictating its initiative which dictates which player is gonna activate their cards first and then it's also gonna have an immediate effect as soon as it goes into play as well as a special action that you'll be able to use for the rest of that turn but it's also gonna determine how many cards that you get to draw into your hand for your next turn so these scheme cards are going to be offering you a lot of different options that you're going to have to consider that I think is going to make each turn really fun. And then after that, the players are going to be taking turns performing actions by playing cards in their hand or out on their tableau, and the round ends as soon as all players have passed. Combat in this game is also done in a really fun and interesting way where you're going to be issuing threat depending on the cards that you put into battle, and then players are going to be trying to disregard that threat or manipulate it or send it back to the player that sent it to them, and you're going to be pushing this threat back and forth, and any threat that you're not able to deal with is going to inflict damage on your character and of course the first character to lose all their health is going to lose that battle but this giveaway is going to be for the welcome to the five sales pledge which is going to come with a copy of the game as well as all digital and physical stretch goals and to enter this giveaway all you have to do is leave a comment down below i'm not going to worry about hashtags this week because this is the only giveaway i'm going to be running in the comment section but just to make it fun if you were to rename this channel with a pirate or sea themed name I want to know your best take at it, so let us know in the comment section below. Good luck in the giveaway, and I'll draw the winner for this at the end of next week's video. And I lied, there is going to be one more giveaway in the comment section this week, and this is going to be for the Nazo Nazo playing cards, and this is an interesting deck of playing cards. If you take all the cards out and piece them together, it does create a bit of a puzzle that creates one giant mural. And within the artwork, there's over 100 different visual riddles in the form of idioms, proverbs, and plays on words for players to discover, and also used for different scavenger hunts to find other images matching those in the other areas of the artwork. And the artwork itself features anthropomorphic animals and whimsical scenes all with a Japanese theme. And of course the cards can just be used as a deck of cards but this image here just shows you how much is packed into a single card and how much hidden meaning there is for players to discover. And this giveaway is going to be for the single suit pledge which comes with three different types of decks. You have your guest house deck, the tatami room puzzle deck, and the onsen deck which is a limited edition deck and you're probably not going to be able to find it after this campaign. And under this giveaway, just leave a comment down below with the hashtag Nazo and let us know of either your favorite card game or your favorite artist. Now let's go ahead and draw the winners for last week's giveaway. And this was for a copy of Lunar Rush and a draw winner. I use this fancy application here and all these extra names down here are bonus entries for my Patreon subscribers. If you like this sort of content and want to help make this channel just a little bit more sustainable for me, I truly appreciate it. You can check out links in the description below. I cover all these games for free and I don't take anything from publishers and I often don't even talk to the publishers when I talk about their games, but I do try to reach out to them and get some additional info. 
Let's go ahead and draw those comments and draw the winner. And the winner is Zoltan Harashigi. This is pretty fun because this one is actually from a bonus entry that I granted back in my birthday episode where I asked everyone where they thought this little duck went because it was missing at the time and whoever got it right I granted some free bonus entries to until they eventually won. So since you won I'm going to remove those bonus entries and stay tuned if I ever do something like that in the future because it it was fun. So congratulations Zoltan, just reach out to me at adam at shelfclutter.com and I'll get that pledge all sorted out for you. And the next few giveaways we had last week was for a copy of Bonnie and Clyde, a copy of Fear of the Unknown, and a copy of Pocketbook Adventures. But for these three giveaways, I didn't run them on the YouTube channel. Instead, I ran them over on the Discord. And to enter this giveaway, all you had to do was check out the Discord in the description below and head over to the giveaways channel. And all you had to do was click the little emoji underneath the giveaway and that will get you automatically entered into that giveaway. And the winners haven't been drawn yet, so if you're quick enough, you can check out the Discord in the description below and you might be able to get in on some of those giveaways. And if you also just want to get notified anytime I run these giveaways over on the Discord, you can check out the rules channel and just click this little gift underneath that post and that'll just automatically sign you up for notifications. So anytime I post a giveaway in that channel, you'll get notified on your phone or on your desktop depending on how to use Discord. And that is everything I have for you this week. And this is another episode that's going to be going up a little bit later than usual. I didn't get to start filming this until 12 a.m. last night. I had a big release at work yesterday and I was literally working until midnight and I'm still juggling a bit of that this morning along with this video. So my work life and board game life is not being very kind to me right now because I had over 25 different games to cover, which is like three times more games than a usual week. So if I happen to lose even more hair for next week, you know why. But on the positive side, there are a ton of really exciting games and definitely a few that I'm going to be checking out myself and following along with. And I hope there's a few that you liked as well. As always, thanks so much for watching. I got to get to editing this video so I can actually get this out at a decent hour. So until next time, keep that shelf cluttered and the table full. Oh.